Hi everybody, I'm Ralph ben Murgy. Welcome to Not That Kind of Rabbi. Don't ask. Um, we're having fun doing this through the Canadian Jewish News, and there's all kinds of great at the CJN podcast that you can pick up as well. Um, this time, I get to talk to an old friend who I haven't spoken to in a very long time, who has decided to, well, what can I say, just sort of barf up her life and let us take a good look at it. Um, Diane Flax is going to be my guest She's got a, a, a show that's uh, just finished its run at the Tarragon Theatre in Toronto. Guilt, a love story. It's going to Montreal. It's going all over the place. It's going to be great. And she's here to talk about it. Hi, Diane. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you, Ralph? Good. So well, this is your like fifth one-person show, I think? Yeah. I, I'm not, I haven't learned anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, you get to pay you. That's yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, instead of seven <laughs> other people, um, there's a lot to talk about here. So uh, I, I just want to jump into the word guilt. Mm-hmm. So one of your uh, theories, I believe, is that guilt is the Jewish default setting. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Explain, please. <laughs> well, what I say is, when you don't know what to feel, you should feel guilty, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that it forms the basis of our moral code of that I shouldn't do something terrible to you that would make me feel bad and you shouldn't do something terrible to me. You know, like the the golden rule, as we know, in Judaism is the opposite of what the sort of common uh, apocryphal knowledge of it is, is that we should not do something to someone that would cause harm and we want them not to do something harmful to us. So to me, that implies you're not doing it because you feel bad. And, you know, some people have said to me, it's not real that, you know, Jewish mothers and Jewish boobies. And well, it was in my case. We yeah. really, I mean, you grew up with this too, right? Yeah. Well, you know, we had the Moroccan version. Right. You mingled it with uh, anger and regret. And, and, and chickpeas. Know, and chickpeas and potatoes. And yeah, <laughs> you pretty well have what you were looking for. And a little cumin. A little cumin. <laughs> <laughs> Everything with cumin. Uh, <laughs> tell me about your booby. Mm. Well, she really was the person that said, um, why, why don't you call? I could be lying on the floor, dead for three days. You don't call. I'll give you a quarter. You need a quarter? She really was that type of person. I remember being five years old, distinctly, and saying to my mom, nobody has called Bubby for three hours. She must feel so lonely. <laughs> you know, and Mission it, accomplished. Oh, yeah, done. <laughs> Check. <laughs> she got that one right. She did, but she was really real a real ferocious survivor. I mean, she really did save my mom and her husband through the Holocaust by moving, keeping one, literally one village ahead of the Nazis and going east, 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 ending up in Siberia. So she was a really remarkable person. But when she entered our lives, you know, she was old before her time. And really did have that kind of sort of deep, (laughs) crazy wound of no one's, no one is doing enough for me. Hmm. And rightly so, you know? Yeah. I mean, was it, did that become bitterness? It was quite, it could be really bitter and it could be, and she had a lot of health stuff too. So there was always, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Right. Um, but to me, and it's interesting, I see this with my own kids and my parents, like I had a better relationship with her. I understood her and she I had a different kind of bond than, of course, her own children or her mm. own child did. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so sad when you think about intergenerational trauma has become, mm-hmm. everybody says it, mm-hmm. but to really parse it and live it is, a, is yeah. another thing altogether. And certainly with Holocaust, mm-hmm. you know, there's, uh, I'm sure for, your mother, there was a, a lot to deal with as well. Um, so let's talk about this. This is, I mean, I've known you a long time. Uh, I knew you before you were married, mm-hmm. and uh, then you were married, and what, both your kids getting born, and it wasn't an easy journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, why did you decide you wanted to talk about all of that stuff in this show? 
I, what was it what was happening for me was that I was feeling this deep sense of guilt. And as I say it in the play, I felt like I was walking around with the raccoon in a cage inside my chest at all times. And this guilt was causing me to not be myself, not be present, overcompensate like crazy, um, really try to minimize damage in a way that I think was becoming so consuming and counterproductive. And I realized that I am not the only one. <laughs> And while it was doing all those things, it was also, and you and I are similar in this way, I couldn't help but also find it funny. Like there was a lot of humor in it. It was ridiculous. And like I say in the play, you know, I was buying, ordering my kids sushi from Uber Eats, which is ridiculous. There's a sushi place 10 feet from every home in Toronto, right? It's that kind of thing. And I, I started to realize the absurdity of my inability to let go of this monster of guilt. And I, I talked about it a bit on stage one time, and I realized from the response that made people, A, un, super uncomfortable, but really also they were, they were riveted by the idea of trying to tackle this thing, and especially by a person who was admitting that they were accountable for something. And you've got a situation where you're, you're far into it. You've been married for a long time. You've got two kids. Yeah. What was it like to realize... I don't think I can do this. It took me a really long time. I mean, probably in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a long time, but I just couldn't, I couldn't conceive of the fact that I would take an action that would harm my family. Even though the action I see in retrospect was, was the right move, I couldn't, and even in the time, even if I did think it was the right move at the time, I just couldn't accept it. I was so socialized to take care of everyone. It, it it was it was unspeakable to me. So that was what I was wrestling with. Well, on the other hand, when you're thinking of doing something like that and you're looking at these two kids, even though they're not small anymore, yeah. um, you're thinking you're going to be the bad guy. Yeah. You know? And, you know, I, I was willing to be the bad guy in the sense, and I am in this play as well, in the sense that I'm willing to say it was my decision. Do I think it was all my fault? No, I don't. But it, I was the one who took the action. And because I was so much of the anchor in the family, it, it really felt like, it felt in, indescribable. I, I just couldn't believe it was, I was doing it even though as I was doing it. And, and again, I, I don't, it's not about blame. It's just that, 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 that unique circumstance, and, and as it turns out, it's not unique, but the, a parent who feels like they have to take a step that's going to harm their children in whatever way. You know, you, you really wish there was some other way. So how do you put this into a show that I want to go to and go, that was great? Well, I think the thing my friend <laughs> says is, you know, Bruce McCullough, he said yeah. this to me too. Like he said, it's funny. It's really funny. Like there's so many funny, funny things that we're talking about here and ridiculous. And at the same time, I'm really trying to be brave and to present a perspective that doesn't pull punches and is pretty unflinching. And I think, you know, Ralph, you're like this too. Like we have an intellectual curiosity about things. And I think somebody, a director of mine that I work with at Stratford, who's very intellectual, super heady, everything's a thesis for her, wrote me and said, I really appreciate it. And she's German. So I have to do it like this. I really appreciate it how in the intellectual parts of the show. Also, it was funny. And I'm like, thank you for giving comedy notes from the German director. But still. You didn't yeah. cite anyone, though. You have to do your citations. If you're going <laughs> exactly. To I totally. And, you know, I do a lot of characters in it. And I embody a lot of things that that I, like the, I actually embody the raccoon that was in my chest. And so I'm, I'm finding fun ways, ridiculous ways to tackle something. Like, you, you know, whenever something is a massive thing that you're dealing with in life, you know, you especially know this, you have to find a way through with humor or you can't get through. So that's what I'm doing with this. So the lubricating uh, gel was tequila, apparently. <laughs> At the beginning, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, how 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 much was that uh, consuming you at that point? It's sort it of self medicating, right? I, yeah, totally self medicating. Totally trying to numb myself out. And and I'm not, you know, really. As my doctor said, you're a good Jewish girl. What's going on here? Like, I really was not a drinker. I would tr in theater school. I really wanted to try to get addicted to something, and I just <laughs> <laughs> like I wanted to be like everybody else. And so yeah, so it was really shocking that you're like at 50, you're all of a sudden doing the things that maybe you didn't do in your 20s. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you could have chosen something like Pez, getting addicted to Pez <laughs> and different dispensers. That would have... Oh, my God. Wait a minute. Are you revealing something? <laughs> Don't touch to my Batman. Do not touch my Batman. That is my <laughs> Batman. <laughs> so one of the things you've always been able to do, though, is, is populate with characters. And in, in doing it, it's, it's like you're breaking the fourth wall, but you're not. Like, you're, you're talking to the audience, but by becoming all these people, you get to sort of talk about the people who aren't on stage but are. There's something yeah. very interesting about that. Mm -hmm. well, I, think we do, I think we do this when we tell stories, right? When mm -hmm. we Even when we tell the story about the, like... We, I was I'm looking at this window in my office and a car exploded in the street. There was like flames. And so as I'm telling the story of the flames and the car, I'm also telling about the, all the people who were standing on the, with their cell phones going, oh my God, this is totally a car on fire. Like you just, you have to, and the fireman is going, he's just like lackadaisically, well, I guess the, that was a tire that exploded. Like, you know, you, you can't help it when you're telling the story because you see all the the elements that populate it. That's right. So, the selfie with the with the fire at the car. Oh, ridiculous. And meanwhile, I'm looking out my window, so not, yeah. I'm not any <laughs> well, now you're going to feel guilty about that. I don't think so. You just look at <laughs> the window. Uh, so, uh, has your ex seen the show? No. Will she not see the show? Like she doesn't want to see the show. Um. Like, do you I, talk at all? Yeah, no, we do. We talk. We're we're very, very, very good co-parents. Um, we, we, yeah, no, we're we're really good, and the kids are really good, really good, hmm. really good. And um, I I don't know. We we managed to do this well somehow, and they seem but to. But she be didn't come see the show. No. Too much. Um. Well, it's you know I have as. I have the, and you know this too as an artist, like you have the right to process your life through art if that's the way that you need to get through your life. And that's your, you know, that's what I've been doing for whatever, however many long, I've been in theater 30 years something. So that's par for the course for me, but that's not how everybody processes their life, you know? And some mm. people don't want to see, they don't want to witness it. They don't want to go back there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, I respect that. What about the, the the boys? Have they seen it? Um, my eldest has is in Boston. He's read it. And he's going to come see it uh, in Montreal. So that's great. My youngest is still a little bit maybe it's you know it's a, it might not be exactly appropriate for him at this age. He's seventeen, but it's still it's a bit much maybe for him. Uh, mm -hmm. My son's girlfriend came and saw it the other day, and she she just loved it. And she's she, you know you, you're showing your kids a whole other side of you, right? Um, I have found with my work that, that it's been hard for my kids to see me and stuff that I've written because a lot of the content is a bit mature for them. Uh, so, um, but it, maybe they'll see me in things that I haven't written. <laughs> <Or like. laughs> and it'll be still mature for them, but you didn't write it. So that's yeah. the important part. Yeah. Um, what did you learn about the Jewishness of you and how mm -hmm. you process your life? You know, you can't run away from it is the thing. Like I went to chat, I went to Associated in chat, and so I have all this stuff in the back of my head. The in the play, I also to retell the story of Hagar and Ishmael in the desert and Lot's wife, and I talk about Cain and Abel, and and all these biblical stories came late into the play, and I realized that you know it's we are steeped in this you know version of morality that's a cross between empathy and you know regret and anger and all these things and it populates our deep visceral imagery I think it is a real part of who I am and it was such a part of what I was going through as a Jewish mother that it became quite central to the piece more than I expected hmm. 
I and you really took center stage. So when that starts to happen, you have to make a decision. Am I going to go with this? Or uh, no, no, that wasn't what I was headed towards. Like what, what made you decide, no, I'm, I'm going to both feed in? I didn't have a choice. It really became so clearly a part of the story. And what I've also found in my work, the more specific you are, the more universal it is. So the more specific I am about my experience in terms of what it's like to be a Jewish person with guilt, I cannot tell you how many Catholic people have come, come up to me, sought me out, written me notes about their experiences uh, growing up Catholic. Or my friend who's from Newfoundland, growing up in Newfoundland, and our two designers who are Korean. This is exactly my life. Really? You know, because I was specific about my culture, it twigged what was specific about their culture. That's interesting because, you know, there would be people who would take the, the guilt and put it like a medal on their jacket and say, you yeah. know, but Jews, mm -hmm. we have guilt. The rest mm -hmm. of you, you don't, from guilt, you don't know. Right? <laughs> but right? everybody, everybody has something, some legacy culturally from their family. And, every, and even if it isn't cultural. There's family dynamics that are so entrenched and, and you know, ugh, that are like tentacles that go around you. Tell me about the racehorse. <laughs> well, that's the name that I use for my partner, who we've been with together now almost eight years. And she is, she is a racehorse. And <laughs> in many ways, she's uh, younger than me. She's athletic. She's um, powerful. And she sort of raced into my life, uh, and we have been together ever since. You, she's seen the show. Mm -hmm. She's what? hugely, a huge fan of it. Um, even though I focus on a time in our lives that was difficult, yeah. she, what she's really helped me to do, and I talk about it in the show, is she sort of showed me to me. Um, I don't think I was present in my life, and she mm -hmm. really every day helps me to be really myself. So there's one part in this journey in the show where you uh, and your uh, first partner uh, go for couples therapy mm -hmm. and then decide on uh, open opening up your marriage. Mm -hmm. Tell me how does how do you perform that part of the story? Well, I do I talk about how for a lot of people, a lot of couples, there's a moment that is the moment when the, where the sort of plate glass window that is your love shatters. And maybe it's nothing that causes it, like it's a tiniest tap, tiniest moment. And that's what happened. We had a moment like that for us. And we really, there was no turning back from that moment. And we, I suggested couples therapy and opening up our marriage. And what I say in the play is, I don't know which one was more destructive. And then I add, Actually, I do, and it rhymes with schleppel's therapy because I actually <laughs> found couple therapy in our case not helpful, <laughs> not helpful, not not helpful at all. And it wasn't any any slight to the therapist. It's just sometimes there's it's too late. Yeah, well, th that's the thing though for the therapist. Uh, I'm married to one, and uh, you know one of the things she's taught me is you're not there to save people's marriages. You're there to help them navigate where they're at and where they want to be. And that may not be to be together, right? Yeah. So, you know, when they say, well, we, we, we didn't stay together anyway, so that therapist sucked. It's like, <laughs> you didn't want to stay together anyway, so. Yeah. No, so, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, you're totally right. And it wasn't the therapist. And the thing is, like I've said before, and I've tried to show in the play, we had a great relationship for many years we raised children beautifully there's no bad guy here right. you know um and it's really important for me that i just present a story of the person who is the good jewish mother who's taking responsibility for something and that that's the thing that i think is the interesting dra drama of it is the, the perspective that we haven't really seen in the zeitgeist so much you know, you have the scorned woman, the other yeah, woman, yeah. the victim, woman as victim, but you don't necessarily see, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I remember this movie Winter Tan with um, Jackie Burroughs that was like oh, yeah. many, many years ago. And it was like the woman who goes out of her mind and has a midlife crisis and blows her life up. And that's not exactly what I did. Um, I didn't go out of my mind, but I did kind of have a midlife crisis. And mm -hmm. I really haven't seen a lot of that out there. So I thought, well, this is an interesting story to tell.
Hmm. You know, when I think about in the heterosexual couple world, mm -hmm. if the woman leaves, that's mm -hmm. like, how could you do such a thing? Exactly. It's men who leave, you know, right. and, and they're the heartless one, and they're the one who had an affair or found someone else, and mm -hmm. you know, all of that, you know, there's all that stuff that goes on. So when you're in a same-sex marriage, it's, you know, from the outside people can't go, you know, she left? Is it, which she? Right, but I guess what I was try I'm trying to show in the play is I, I, just by nature of my work, I, because I had a more flexible job, I ended up being more of the default mom at home. Right, right. Um, because my ex had a great job and was able to, you know, work a real work in the real world, <laughs> so and, <laughs> um, and support us in a lot of ways. And uh, I still worked a ton, but I was the one who was who's around more. So that, and also not only that, it's my nature. I became that Jewish mother. It was my choice to become kind of this, you know, eat the burnt toast put yourself last kind of mother. Right. But as I say, I w it was delighting, delightful for me because I loved it. Um, so that I really was like that qu kind of classic woman in a heterosexual relationship. Right. And the thing that I have found is that a lot of men have been coming up to me and saying, we always get the label of the bad guy when we leave or when we find someone else or whatever it is. There's so much more to it. Like even, even if you do feel like you're the bad guy, you, you're suffering. You don't mm. want to hurt people, you know? So mm. a lot of the time men just shut down and go, but, they, but they're experiencing the same kinds of feelings that I was. Mm. So true. So you doing this show right now, it's a charged time, and to be Jewish Ugh. and publicly Jewish is a thing. Yeah. Uh, how did that factor into what happened during this, the, the premiere of this play? Well, I'm happy to report that nothing has happened. I'm happy to report that people do, you know, I think the the algorithm is tricking us all. You know, the yeah. algorithm, uh, the extremism of point of view is is coming so into the mainstream that we don't know what's real anymore. And and I think in the in reality, people want to see stories and I've been really happy that I've been able to just be up there as a human being who is Jewish and not and just be myself and and tell a story. And feel welcome, but I'll tell you, in rehearsal, I was nervous. I was scared. You were, eh? Yeah, sure. It, as you say, it's a hard time to be out, outwardly Jewish right now. It's a little scary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're taking the show. It's finished its run in Toronto. You're going to Montreal for when? Um, I think we, oh, I believe we open on the 12th of March till the 30, 30th, hmm. and then or 31st, and then we go to... Winnipeg at the Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre, and we are there until April 21st. So Centaur in Montreal, RMTC warehouse in Winnipeg, and I know there's a lot of Jewish communities out there, so I hope they come. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the show is called Guilt, A Love Story. Diane Flax is the star of the show, funnily enough, because she also wrote the show and plays every single character in the show, so stuff happens. <laughs> um, I hope you have uh, more and more great runs of this. I think it's really important. For, I know that you gave up a lot of, here I am, this is my life, uh, to do it. So uh, bravo to the courage of that and the uh, the wisdom of, of the fifth show, I'm sure, uh, will show itself to anyone who wants to hear it. So uh, have a great run, and uh, thank you for doing this with me. Oh, thank you, Ralph. It's so great to see you. Thank you, you so much. You too. You take care of yourself. <laughs> thank you. Diane Flax, playwright, actress, director, mother, mother, mother. <laughs> <laughs>